Welcome to Pinewood Church. My name is Parker Manuel, and I am so excited to see you today. Well, you heard the news. We're talking about joy. And so many of you are thinking, hallelujah. I am in desperate need of a little bit of joy in my life today. So we're kicking off a collection of talks. Get your joy back. And this is not a collection of talks where I'm going to give you the five steps to joy. And, and the psychologists say, this is, not what this, is. this is not what we do here. At Pinewood Church, we believe that the Bible is the sole authority for our lives. It's what we put our faith and our trust in. We believe that it is without error. And so today, we are not going to look to best practices. We are going to look to Bible principles. We're going to see what the Bible has to say about bringing your joy back and being restored to the joy of your salvation. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Well, as a kid, as far back as I can remember, I have struggled with intense, paralyzing anxiety this is confession i i mean even from a child my parents would not tell me when we were going to travel because they knew i would be up all night with stomach issues i would just i always had this fear of the unknown and i have slight or extreme ocd so i would be thinking to myself well I wonder what time we're going to leave what should I pack? Where are we going to go? I wonder how long it's going to be there. Where are we going to stay? Who are we going to see when we get there? When do we get there? How long are we going to stay? Is this even going to be fun? Am I going to like this? Who am I going to sit next to in the car? I would obsess about every detail, so much so that I would just get paralyzed and sick. Not only that, but this intense level of anxiety led to a lot of physical issues. How many of you know that anxiety doesn't just affect you emotionally and mentally it affects you spiritually and physically and so i will spare you the details but let's just say i was very unhealthy as a child so much so that my parents would take me to doctors and specialists and they would run every test you can imagine every blood sample took a camera down my stomach and then finally there was one doctor who came to my mom and said well Good news is, he's healthy. Bad news is, he's got a lot of worry. He's got a lot of anxiety. I think your son is just stressed out. Isn't that crazy? If you know me now, you might be thinking, really, you are that intense? Yeah, I am still that same kid. I'm just a little taller. I feel like my parents did an exceptional job about discipling me and pointing me to Scripture walking we, me on that journey towards healing, but the reality is I still experience a lot of that anxiety today. Am I speaking to anybody in the house who deals with a little bit of anxiety? Okay, a couple people. All right. Then I want to talk to everyone in the room today because at some level we all experience some type of worry, especially in the last two years. Even if you're not a person of anxiety and you're like happy all the time, you don't worry about anything, that has been tested over the last few years. Think about from a global perspective. From a global perspective, we've had violent wars. We've had mass shootings. We've had a global pandemic. We've had economic uncertainty at every level. Man, this guy is not inspiring me at all. Then from Boulder, narrow it down just a little bit, from Boulder, we had a, a mass shooting. We experienced a global pandemic here as well. We had historic wildfires, uh, intense political divide. And that's just Boulder. So take from the global scale, then a Boulder scale, and now let's zero in on your life. And I don't know everyone's story. You're sitting there thinking, you don't know me? You're right. I don't know. But I know enough of you to know that you're going through stuff. Heavy stuff. Real stuff. Painful stuff. I know that there's pressure from your career. I know there's a lot of decisions that you have to make coming up. I know there's tension in your relationships. 
I know for many of you, you here in, in the house today have experienced significant loss in relationships. You've had loved ones pass away. And man, it has been an absolute brutal last two years for you. It has, has for me. Maybe I'm speaking for myself here. It has for me. But there's good news. The good news is, is that through it all, I believe that God is calling us back to joy. To, to not forget about his love for us and how good he is and how through all of this, we can still have joy in every season and in every circumstance. So I want to tell somebody today, get your joy back. Get your joy back. Say that with me. Get your joy back. Say, I need joy. Come on, we all do. Joy is not found in the absence of pain, but in the presence of God. Joy is not found in the absence of pain, but the presence of God. This is not one of those messages where I'm telling you, suppress your sadness. Just put a superficial smile on your face. That's not what we're talking about today. See, joy is not in the absence of pain, but in the presence of, of God. Joy is not contingent on your circumstances. It's not controlled by your feelings, and it's not created in your own effort. I want to say that again. Joy is not contingent on your circumstances. It's not controlled by your feelings, and it is not created in your own effort. Joy is a gift from God on your life. It is the realization that he loves me. His grace has washed over me, and his salvation has restored me. The title of today's message is The Choice to rejoice, the choice to rejoice, that you get to choose to come back to joy. Why do you get to choose? Because we see clearly from Scripture that joy is not just an emotion of what is happening to you, whether it be your season or your circumstance, but joy is what's happening through you in Jesus Christ. And it is the command of God. How many of you know, joy is not a suggestion in Scripture. Hey, you know, if you want to be joyful, that'd be awesome. Just maybe a little bit of joy will go a long way. A spoonful of joy helps the medicine go down. It's going to be good for your soul. People might like you better. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches it as a command. It says, be joyful. Always rejoice. Just in case you didn't hear, I'll say it again. Rejoice is what the Bible says. So it's not only a command, but it's also a fruit of the Spirit. If there is somebody that says that they're walking with the Spirit and they're doing everything right, they're reading the Word, they're deep in their prayer closet, they got the right people around them, and they're just a straight-up bummer to be around, you do not have the Holy Spirit in you, okay? Read Galatians, fam. It is a fruit of of the Spirit, meaning that evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life and you walking with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a little bit of joy in your life. And that joy is going to be contagious. Finding joy is not to suppress grief, sadness, and pain, but it's a submission to the authority of God over your life. So you're saying, I don't feel a lot of joy, and I want to say maybe we need to take a step of faith to submit a little more to God. Take a step of faith to surrender a little bit more to God and to trust God. Philippians 4. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians 4. We're going to look at a couple verses here. And we're going to be moving right along. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get you a Bible out in the hallway. Or you can read on the screen. And if you want a study Bible, let us know and we will buy you any Bible you want. Any Bible, any translation, as long as it is the actual Bible. <laughs> Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice! Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then we, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts 
and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul is the author of this letter, and he's writing this to a church that he planted on his second missionary journey. Paul loves this church, fond memories of this church. And I love how he comes back in this letter to encourage the church to say, always be full of joy. Take it from me and listen closely. Always be full of joy. Just in case you read it quickly, I'll say it again. Rejoice. So there's three things I want to look at from this text. We're going to pull it right from the text. Number one is rejoice always. Rejoice always. Wouldn't it have made more sense for Paul to have said, rejoice in the Lord most of the time? But let me tell you, I get it. Like if we're being real, I get it. That's not what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. This was Paul writing not from a place of instruction, but from a place of experience. See, the apostle Paul has endured immense suffering up to this point. Persecution, beating. At the point that he's even writing this letter, he is currently in prison. Paul is not writing this from the, the pool at his five-star resort in Cancun saying, fam, living a good life. Don't forget, rejoice. You follow Jesus, it's going to be good for you. You know what I'm saying? That's not what he's saying at all. He's from prison after having been beaten, falsely accused, and put in jail. He's saying rejoice. You also see this as Paul's MO whenever him and Silas were preaching in Acts chapter 16. You see that they get thrown in jail again. And it's not like they get thrown in jail and then they're immediately released. I'm talking couple years worth of prison time and what you see with Paul and Silas is is that when they're thrown into prison what I mean I was gonna say how many of you have been in prison but that wouldn't be a good question to ask I mean just imagine you're in prison okay that can't be good all right you're not in a good state you're not in a good place but Paul and Silas are in prison and he says hey we're gonna turn this prison cell into a sanctuary and we're gonna start praying and we're going to start worshiping God because God is just so good. I just can't help but worship. He turned, he turned a prison cell into a worship center. And then we see him take a full-on praise break that leads to a prison break. You see Paul and Silas are in there, and they just start praising and worshiping Jesus, full of joy in their hearts. All of a sudden, the doors just sling wide open. And God was doing something in that prison cell. This is Paul's M.O., the Roman guards at the time, he got so afraid that, that the, the, his prisoners fled that he became suicidal. But then Paul and Silas step in and say, hey, we're not going anywhere. Church isn't over. We still got another 30 minutes of praise break, bro. Don't go anywhere. They began to share the gospel with this Roman soldier, and he gets saved. And what does the Bible say? He goes on rejoicing. How many know that in a moment encounter with the presence of God, you can go from suicidal to rejoicing. An encounter with salvation through the Holy Spirit, whatever circumstance you're in, you go from a earthly, temporary state to a kingdom heavenly level where all of a sudden you're like, things may not be good around me, but things are great in me. I've never felt better in me. God is doing something special in me. I think there's several reasons as to why Paul is encouraging in this. One is, I believe that he's rem he knows that the church needs to constantly be reminded to seek after and pursue joy in the Lord. Times article recorded that a third of all money that goes into um, medical facilities and medical treatment, the root cause, a third of all finances, the root cause is anxiety and war. We are just a stressed out people. And that, that stress and that anxiety and that worry is causing us to be physically unhealthy. So I believe he's reminding us because he knows this is not gonna, this, this pattern you're on is not gonna work well for you. Come back to the joy in the Lord. But then I believe there's a, another reason, a second reason. I believe that Paul is wanting to point out that joy is not contingent on our circumstances. 
I'm going through a hard time. Why can't you just see that this is just a hard time? My, and I don't need to be joyful here. Just let me grieve. Because God is calling you both to a, a deeper level of intimacy with him, and he's calling you to a higher perspective in his kingdom. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about for just a little bit here is when you are not experiencing joy, that there is opportunity to go a little deeper and there's an opportunity to go a little higher. Our circumstances change daily. How many of you know that you can uh, count on your feelings? Anybody ever got really mad, said a bunch of things you don't mean, and then regretted it literally the next second? How confident are you in your emotions? They're fickle. They're all over the place. I mean, I can miss a meal, and I'm in a bad place, okay? I can wake up and not get enough caffeine, and I might, you might not be the most enjoyable person to be around. If that's how much my feelings affect my life and my joy, we're in, we're in a deep state of issue right here. So we have sometimes experiencing our highest of highs and lowest of lows at the same day. And so exactly, exactly in joy, what is our firm foundation is what I'm trying to get at. It's not our circumstances. And it's not what's going on around us. I also see from this passage, I think it's interesting that right after he says to be full of joy, always and rejoice, he says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. I believe that one of the principles that he's trying to call out right here is that, that there is both something happening that God is doing around you and there is something that God is doing through the people around you. So this is when you lift up your perspective a little bit. Philippians 4 or 5, the, uh, another translation, the message translation says it this way. Make it as clear as you can to all you, make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side and that you're working with them and not against them. The principle here is, is that the thing that you're a part of is bigger than the part that you play. That God is doing something bigger in the life around you. And so often we get our head down so fixated and so focused on what is just temporarily in front of us that if for just a second we would lift our head and see what God is moving around us, then I think it would be amazing the joy that we would find. Oh, my gosh. I think this is ever more true being in the church. I can find 10 things right now that I don't like about this church right now. I pastor this church. I mean, there's, there's things that drive me crazy. There's people that drive me crazy. None in this room. None, none, in the, none of you are in this room. But if I keep my head down and I'm so focused on the problem that's right in front of me or how it's just not right or it's not perfect or, or whatever, case, then I become incredibly anxious, overwhelmed, and ultimately I get angry and bitter. But when I lift my head... And I see, wow, guys, we're in Casey Middle School. We're in downtown central Boulder, Colorado. We live in the United States. Of, I don't know. I'm just trying to go big. We're in the world, you know. I don't know. I, don't, I just go as big and I just lift my head. I become grateful. Then I begin to look around at where God is at work around me. And I'm just like, man, can you believe that that person found freedom from addiction? I'm so stoked that that marriage stayed together because, man, had it not been for that conversation, that marriage would have been torn apart. But God opened up a window that I could speak in. And when you lift your head, you begin to see all God is doing. And it swells up joy and gratitude and peace in your spirit. So I want to encourage somebody, lift your head. Somebody here today is not filled with joy because you have not lifted your head to see where God is at work around you. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this way, There are many people who never know the joy of the Lord because they have failed to see themselves as miserable sinners. The only way to be happy in Christ is to be desperately unhappy without Him. I believe, and this is not just here in this house, but I mean globally in the church, that we have lost our desperation for the presence of God, and therefore we have lost peace on this earth in the joy of the Lord. How often do you think of sitting with God in your daily rhythms? How often do you see, think of just meditating on his word day and night? 
like a tree planted by the rivers of water. How often are you just desperate to get alone with him? Man, I've been with people all day, and I just haven't had my time with God. Or it's just kind of every moment of every day, the same thing, same problem, same worry. When you focus on the problem, you fail to see the provision. When you focus on the problem, you fail to see the provision. The greatest provision we have is salvation and our desperation for Jesus Christ. Finding joy in every situation is saying, I may not be in the best health right now, but God, you're so good. Thank you for the breath in my lungs. I may not have the clarity for what the future holds, but God, you know what the future holds, and you've been faithful forever. I may not understand why I'm in all this pain, but God, you're a loving father. You care for me. You give good gifts to your children. Being considerate towards others is saying, I may not be having the best day, but I'm going to show up for somebody that's hurting around me. I have just received some bad news, but I'm not going to take that out on my family. I may have just lost my job, but I'm going to take this pain and this grief and this sorrow, and I'm going to pray for people, many people, who also just lost their jobs. I'm going to lift my head. I'm going to see a higher perspective. I'm going to find joy in the presence of God. The enemy is stealing your joy because he's convinced you that you need to know all of the answers to all of life's problems. That's why later on in the text it says, um, anything we can understand. The peace of God will transcend all understanding beyond anything that we can understand. I believe that the enemy of joy is understanding everything that's going on around you. I believe that God has called us to live in the mystery of his sovereignty. I don't fully know why I'm in this place, why these people around me, why this happened to I don't fully understand, but this I do know. I've got a joy that never stops, a peace that passes all understanding, a father that loves me. That's why my life verse is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, and it says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and to lean not on your own understanding. Why is that my life verse? Well, because of the story that I just told you. I obsess about knowing all the right answers. I obsess about having the solution to everyone's problems. God's saying, hey, it's going to be all right. Trust me. Take your next step. Believe that I got you. Joy is maybe not knowing what the next step, step is, but knowing who's leading and guiding that step. Stress and anxiety is knowing like, okay, I know I'm taking, I know this step. Okay, I'm confident in this step. God's just like, can you, can you walk with mystery? Can you walk with me in the mystery for a moment? Where's the faith? WTF. Where's the faith? Next we see, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. So number two, pray constantly. Rejoice always and pray constantly. Based on the reading of this text, as followers of Jesus, what is biblically sound that we should worry about? Nothing. Don't worry about anything. But... But no, don't worry about anything. All right, based on this text, what should we pray about? The problems? The good things? The bad things? What if we just pray about everything? Scripture says don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. I believe God is calling us from anxious worriers to prayer warriors. Hey, let that, let that sink in. Prayer words. God's calling us to be people of prayer. My house will be called a place of prayer. My people will be called a people of prayer. I want to ask you two questions as it relates to prayer. Number one is, does God have your attention? And number two, does he have your worship? Does he have your attention and does he have your worship? What you pay attention to, what you, what you focus on, you will have affections for. So, Make that as practical as I can in your prayer life. If you are, you love politics, man, you live and breathe it. You might even want to be the governor of Colorado one day. 
Let's go. And all you're doing every day, inundating yourself with politics and politics and politics. Well, now you've, you've put your attention there. Over time, what you put your attention toward, you will gain affections for. Now, all of a sudden, you're maybe a little more attached to politics than you are Jesus. Whatever the case may be, whatever that is for your life, I believe that God is calling us to have affections and intimacy with him in our daily rhythms of our prayer life. I have five kids and one on the way. Just kidding. This is not that announcement. Five kids, a rabbit and a dog. And, <laughs> and my kids are aggressive to make sure that their dad is listening every second of every minute of every day. And some of them like to talk more than others, not necessarily about anything. And the, normally don't even have questions. They just want to talk and they just want to know that I'm listening. And so one of my daughters specifically will say our names 25 times in a row, even if we respond. Dad, yeah, yeah, dad. Yeah, I'm right here. Dad, dad, dad. I'm looking right at you. Speak, daughter. Your father is listening. <laughs> I was thinking about just how aggressive our kids are sometimes with gaining the attention of their father. I was thinking, does, does God feel that from you? Or does he only hear from you when you need something? I would not feel very loved if my kids only came to me when they wanted a popsicle. I want them to come jump in my lap, wrap their arms around me, tell me they love me. Does your heavenly father feel that level of attention and affection from you? Are you running to him every day like, God, God, God? I would give anything to hear God say, what? Jeez. Trying to govern the universe. I give anything for that desperation for God. And I believe that's what he's called you to. That's why he says, don't worry about anything. Why? Because can you both worry and pray at the same time? So God knows that when you're worrying, you are worshiping that problem. You're like, no, it's not worry. We all got problems. We all worry. God says not to. That worry is actually worship to the issue, but prayer is worship to God, our provider. Prayer is worship to the answer. And the second, does he have your worship? Does he have your worship? Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of Christ to which you were called also called in one body rule in your hearts. And what does it say? And be thankful. So you see the correlation all through Scripture. There's the peace of God, and then there's joy. There's the peace that transcends all understanding, and then there's rejoicing, and there's gladness, and there's rest, and there's peace in God. Rejoicing always is not covering up, but crying out. That's what God is trying to say. I'm not saying to cover it up. I'm not saying to suppress the pain and the grief. What you're going through is real. What you're going through hurts. And what you're going through needs Jesus to meet you there. You need his comfort. You need his grace. And you desperately need his joy. And then finally, give thanks in everything. It says, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Is, is peace, is peace a feeling, a temporary feeling? I would say no. I would say that for many, sure. When you say, do you feel peace? Yes. No. But peace is not just a, a temporary feeling. Peace is a person. How does a feeling stand guard over your hearts and your minds? No, a person does that. That God is peace. 
and that he comes into your life and in the uncertainty and in the mystery and in the pain and in the grief, he meets you there and he gives you peace. That transcends anything that we can understand. This is why Christians should be the most chill people ever. The building is burning down and the, and the Christians are like, God's good, he's okay, he's going to take care of us. He is for us, not against us. The gates of hell will not prevail. I'm standing on a firm foundation. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you're like, what? Are you okay? Yeah, the peace of God is transcending all understanding. I don't understand it. I just know it's happening in me and that he's doing it. If you want to change the temperature of a room, be thankful. If you want to elevate an atmosphere, be grateful. Nothing can change the room and nothing can change a heart like some good old-fashioned gratitude. <laughs> what are you thankful for? We experience this with our kids as well all the time. When things start happening, we're like, do you know how good you have it? Just say five things you're grateful for right now. It'll do me a lot of good. And I'm just the same way, though. I forget just how good I have it. You're saying, you don't know my story, you don't know my life, you don't know what I'm going through, and you're right. But if you have salvation, you have something to rejoice about. All right, I want to give you a challenge. And I, you don't have to do this right now, but I would love for you to do this at some point in the day. The challenge is this. Write five things that you're grateful for. And let number one be, I'm grateful for salvation, that I was a sinner and that Christ died for me and that he is alive again. And you'll find that the next four will just roll right off of your tongue. I believe that for so many that are unable to find joy and have a challenge finding joy, it's because you're still tilling the soil to get to the firm foundation. You keep thinking that temporary things or that a career or the next big move or the next raise or the next relationship, you keep thinking that the next thing is going to bring joy, that that is going to be the thing that is in a firm foundation. But those things always change. Those things are extremely temporary. Those things do not last forever. And those things may bring temporary happiness but not lasting joy. It's not until you get to the firm foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you experience eternal kingdom joy the joy that's why it's it's not the joy of your self it's the joy of the lord there's a song it says uh, when i think about the lord how he saved me how he raised me and how he filled me with the holy ghost how he healed me to the uttermost when i think about the lord how he picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on a solid ground it makes me want to shout Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy of all of the glory, of all of the honor, and all of the praise. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me. I think for somebody in the house today, one of the reasons that you are not experiencing joy in your life is because you think you have given your life to Christ, but in reality, you have just been obeying the rules. You think you've surrendered your life to Christ, but in reality, you, you're just attending something. You've never fully said, God, I give you my whole life. That is where you experience joy. God, I turn from whatever I want in my life, and I'm turning 100%. In the other direction, you are now my master and Lord, my Savior and my King. Whatever you say, I will do. That is receiving the gift of God's grace on your life. That is confessing your sins before God. And that is crying out and turning from God. And so I'm not one of those preachers that comes up here and says, I'm going to spend the next five minutes making you doubt your salvation. Give me the time and the place. Where were you the night that you, I'm not, that, I'm not going to do that. I, don't, I, I'm, I, I grew up that way, and every single time I heard that sermon, I'm like, maybe I'm not saved. I'm just going to go get saved again. Just, I'm going to seal this Hummer right now. That's not what I'm saying. But I am asking you to take a realistic inventory of your soul. 
Have you just said, yes, Lord? The Bible even teaches that. Many of you will be standing before the throne saying, haven't we done all of these great things in your name, prophesied in your name? And Jesus is going to say, he's going to turn them away and say, I never knew you. Even, even the demons know that God is raised from the dead. They saw him walk around. Your belief that he's alive is not enough. You have to receive his grace over your, his, your life. You have to repent of your sins, and you have to make him Lord. And so if you're not finding joy the life, you're joy in your life, you're number one. Your very first step of faith today is to say yes to Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, then I want you to follow 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16-18. It says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 